Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of Reddit Podcast Stories. Our first story we'll be reading today. My ex-wife demands I financially support her new family after she used me for years. After that, am I the jerk for refusing to tell my husband the gender of our baby after he skipped going to the doctor's appointment with me? And after that, short me $70,000 in violation of our written agreement? It'll cost you $1.8 million. Now for every thumbs up this video gets, one Karen doesn't get to use her ex-husband for money. Not like I can use you for money, Reddit boy, considering how broke you are. So please smash that like button and subscribe and turn on notifications for news stories from Reddit every single day. My ex-wife demands I financially support her new family after she used me for years. I have two sons, ages 16 and 14, with my ex-wife. Our marriage reached a bitter end when I learned she had remained married to me for over three years so I would support her through returning to school so she could switch careers to an even better paying one, despite her old one paying as much as mine. For years, I tried so hard to save our marriage because I felt it fracture. She played along until she got what she wanted and then she was honest that she had never wanted to save our marriage and had been over me for years. When we divorced, custody was set to 50-50 of our boys so she was ordered to pay child support to me because she was making so much more after her change of career in education. She remarried a year after our divorce and had more kids. After the birth of her last kid four years ago, things got bad. Her husband was diagnosed with cancer. Then one of her kids got diagnosed with a long-term medical condition. Then lockdown impacted her job. Our boys would tell me how rough things were at their moms and how they wanted to live more with me. So I went to the court and the judge moved her down to every other weekend and changed the child support order to reflect her decrease in custody. Recently, she had to move into a smaller house because of how badly they were struggling, and then she came to me for help after the courts refused to end the child support payments. She told me I needed to help her and that I should be helping to take care of my boy's family, and that's what she and her family are. I told her she used me for three years so that she could survive off of my money, she did not get to ask me for more, to support a family that's not my own. She called me a selfish jerk, told me her family is living off charity and they could be so much better off if I would help them. I asked her why I was supposed to care. She told me she wished she had cheated while we were together and that using me for money wasn't enough. Again, she told me about her family and how they would starve. I told her I didn't care if they did or not, that none of them are my problem and I only care about my kids. She called me a jerk. Her husband sent me a text that night saying I was a cruel jerk and he hoped the boys would hate me when they realize I want their whole family to suffer. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk, but make sure you have a high level conversation with your boys so that they'll be prepared for your ex and her husband when they try to paint you as the root of all evil when they go over there. Not the jerk. Is she actually destitute? It doesn't sound like she is. She moved into a smaller house. That's still a house. It's not a shelter, not even an apartment. Are they on food stamps? I'm getting the sense she's having a hard time adjusting to a life on a more modest income, but not that she's totally broke. You also know she has a history of manipulating money out of you. I'd leave this up to the courts. If she was really broke, wouldn't the court lower her child support payments? Not the jerk. While the degree of anger you exhibit is concerning, I don't see you as the jerk. First, your ex and her new husband are threatening to destroy your relationship with your kids. That's enough to go back to the court and try to get full custody if you want to go down that route. As for the finances, she can go to court and ask the judge to reduce her child support payments. Wait, she tried that. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his ex? Please let us know. Not your monkeys, not your circus. Next, Am I the jerk for refusing to tell my husband the gender of our baby after he skipped going to the doctor's appointment with me? My husband and I are expecting. This is our first baby and we're excited. Thing is, he barely attends any doctor's appointments with me and his excuses aren't even valid. He's willing to miss the doctor's appointments over soccer or a drink or board games with his friends. His response is always, I'm not the one carrying the baby. Why do I have to go see the doctor with you? Last week was my final straw. He was supposed to come with me for the baby's gender reveal appointment, but he chose to not come last minute because his friend invited him to fish and chips meal. I was pretty livid, but I didn't make a fuss about it. My mom went with me instead. He texted asking me to tell him the results, boy or girl, 
but I refused to tell him. He kept spam calling me, but I hung up each time. He came home fuming, demanding I tell him the results, but I refused and bluntly told him since he refused to attend the appointments, then he gets no results till after the baby is born and said I was willing to die on this hill. He went off calling me spiteful and immature for doing this and punishing him. He said he's the father and has the right to know. He then called me dramatic since I wasn't alone and my mom was with me. I said he gets no results, period. He's been fuming about it and told his family, and they're now pressuring me to stop playing mind games with him and tell him, but I declined. Am I the jerk? Update. I just wanted to mention that my husband just attempted to contact my doctor to get the results. It didn't go well and we had another argument over it. He couldn't get it since his mom was the one who made the call. Not the jerk. Already a deadbeat dad before the baby is even born. I would drop a friend if I found out they prioritized fish and chips over their wife and baby's doctor's appointment. If he's telling you, I'm not carrying the baby, why do I have to go to the doctor with you? That's going to turn into, I didn't push out that baby, why should I look after it? Real quick. Not the jerk. Not the jerk. My ex pulled this with our second baby and I caved and told him, I shouldn't have. You need to seriously reconsider this relationship. He's showing you that he and his friends are more important than you and your baby. He sees going to appointments with you as punishment, not as a chance to make sure you and the baby are healthy. Don't be like me and stay until he leaves you for another woman. Everyone sucks here. This whole dynamic is so toxic. If he's not being a supportive partner, I recommend considering walking away and looking for alternative sources of support, like your family. Playing these kinds of games, especially where the child is the pawn, is bad for everyone and will undoubtedly affect your kid if this continues into his or her adolescence. If your relationship doesn't last, do you want him to co-parent with you? If so, it's instrumental to separate your relationship with him from his relationship to your kid. As a co-parent, he should have access to the same medical information about his kid as you. Short me $70,000 in violation of our written agreement? It'll cost you $1.8 million. Disclaimer. The names and some of the situations have been changed to protect the identities, but the dollars and general nature of this situation is completely true. Background. A year out of school in the early 90s, I procured a job as a business analyst for a large, family-owned tech company. This business was located in the booming heart of technology at the time and was very profitable. As tech took over the next decade, the company thrived and remained family-owned, which was a rich family and company became exceedingly wealthy with a valuation and net worth in the high nine, low ten figures. The family that owned it was quite neurotic, very moody and had a reputation as very ruthless, greedy when it came to financing, deal making, employees, etc. I truly believe this is what held them back from ultimately becoming a household name as a company. As I progressed in the company, I gained more and more face time with the owners. I worked on some projects directly with ownership that really paid off and gained me even greater access to their inner circle. Now, like a lot of people at the time, and particularly those who worked in tech, I was heavily invested in tech stocks. I discussed some of my investments and gains with ownership as casual conversation, though investing had nothing to do with my role in the company. That is, until one day in late 1999, when the owner came to me and asked me if I would invest some of his personal money. He wanted me to take big risks to see if they would pay off using $1 million of his personal money. I was a bit hesitant, but still, being in my late 20s and wanting to prove myself, I said I would. I asked for a written agreement where they acknowledged this wasn't my role in the company, was a personal matter between the owners and me, and to document my compensation for this side arrangement, 20% of all profits. Around this same time, and by working in the industry, I started to notice the weakness associated with a lot of tech companies. They just weren't living up to their hype and stock price, and some seemed like they were starting to run out of money. I had no inside information, just a strong sense of which companies were struggling based on my work in the business. Based on this, I started using both my money and my owner's money to short tech companies just after the new year in 2000. For anyone unfamiliar with shorting, it means if the value of a stock decreases, the value of the investment increases. I had a few long positions, but my overall position was very short. Since the owner wanted a big risk and big reward, I used his money and obtained leverage or margin from the financial institution where I maintained both his and my trading accounts. The accounts were separate, but both under my name. 
Again, I documented this and gained consent. Well, both my account and his suffered some moderate losses in the first two months of 2000 before the bubble began to burst. Then both accounts, but his in particular, began to skyrocket. Ownership's pettiness. In June, the company began to suffer a downturn. We were still profitable, but since we provided tech services and products, we were not immune to weakness in the broader market. I had not informed the owner of my short strategy. He came to me one day and asked how his money was doing, saying he suspected it was way down like the general market. To his surprise, I informed him that while we still had some money tied up in options, puts and shorts, but based on the positions I had closed, there was $1.35 million in cash sitting in the account that belonged to him. Again, I still had a bunch of open positions, which, if memory serves, were worth about a million on that date. But the positions I had closed had yielded $1.35 million in cash just sitting in his account, which was in my name. The owner, either through ignorance or lack of attention, said, Great, $1.35 million. Fantastic work in this down market. Will you please wire it to me? I responded that I would, but would be taking my 20% of the $350,000 profit, or $70,000, before wiring him the $280,000. I reminded him that I still had open positions that had yet to pay off or close, but I didn't state the amount. He, once again, appeared not to understand or comprehend the open position statement, but instead totally focused on and became incensed about my rightful claim for $70,000. He went on and on about how times were tough, I should be grateful for a job, particularly at my young age, and the entire $350,000 was necessary for him in the company. I knew this wasn't true based on my position within the company. Worse, this was my first time personally experiencing the greedy and corrupt nature that served as the basis for ownership's reputation. Now comes the revenge. Since, after two separate conversations, the owner didn't seem to grasp that the open positions would yield at least some income and thus additional profit, I decided not to mention it again. I sent him back the entire $1.35 million and continued to manage the open positions to the best of my ability. And here's the kicker. The owner never brought it up again. He seemed to think the $1.35 million payment was the entire value of the account and never understood or remembered that open positions still existed. He never asked for records, tax documents, or any time of audit or financials. Given the fact that he was dishonest with me, I didn't feel the need to disabuse him of that notion. Ultimately, after a bit more net gain, I covered all of the shorts and exercised all of the options, puts in this case, for an additional $1.8 million. I worked for the company for three more years and owner never asked about it during my tenure, after I gave notice or since. I know it's a bit crass and even shady, but given his dishonesty with me over the $70,000, I felt justified in keeping the additional $1.8 million. I paid taxes on the gain, long-term capital gain, and went on my way with a fantastic nest egg. Nobody has asked about it since, and I have only told the story to a few people, and even then, only after the statue of limitations passed. The final ironic cherry on top of this Sunday is that during my remaining three years, I gained greater influence with ownership and position within the company because they considered me loyal for giving the $1.35 million back and not making too much of a stink about the $70,000 profit. Little did they know, I got the better of them. The company eventually folded due to family disputes, but my understanding is that ownership walked away in a very good financial position. They likely could have been much better in greater company had they not practiced the same dishonesty that they showed me with their vendors, clients, and employees. Update there have been no negative consequences from this. In fact, the remaining family members have reached out a time or two about some consulting work. They have no clue. Am I the jerk for having a tent full of toys and books in the living room when my nieces and nephews aren't allowed to use it? My husband and I have four kids, Allie, who's 17, Andrew, 15, Charlotte, 12, and Lucas, 9, and we've been fostering Emily, who's six, for almost a year. Emily has special needs, she gets overwhelmed easily, and when she gets overwhelmed, she hides. Emily is also very small and a master at getting herself into tight spaces, under the couch, inside a kitchen cabinet, inside a dollhouse, etc. So when she hides, it can take forever to find her. She'll also lock the door of the room that she's hiding in, then hide to make it that much harder to get to her. We bought her a tent shortly after she moved in with us. We let her pick out everything in the tent, from the mat on the floor to the toys and books inside, 
and we got her to go to her tent whenever she gets overwhelmed or feels like she has to hide. Nobody is allowed in that tent without Emily's permission. We have the tent in a corner of the living room. It's one of the few places where she can't lock a door and we can see her in the tent for most places in the house. My family hosted Christmas this year. Before everyone came over, we told Emily to put away whatever toys she didn't want anyone playing with. She put some of her toys in her tent and some in her room and insisted on locking the door. When everyone got here, Emily hid in her tent and started to play with her toys. We explained to the kids that the tent is Emily's special place and that they are not allowed to go inside or use any of the toys inside. The kids were upset, but we had a couple of toys for them. Plus, Lucas was willing to share his toys. My siblings approached me multiple times on Christmas and asked why I put something so tempting as a tent full of toys in front of their kids, then say that they're not allowed to use it. I explained that the tent prevents Emily from endangering herself and that it has to be there because it's one of the few places where we can see it for most places in the house. When we got Emily out of the tent, some kids tried to go inside and I told them they're not allowed in there even when Emily isn't in the tent. I closed it up and put duct tape on the zipper to prevent the kids from opening it. Some siblings left right after we ate because of the tent, and some stayed but went off on me in private for taunting their kids with the tent. My parents agree with my siblings that it was rude and want to host future holidays so Emily won't have the tent. Was I the jerk for keeping the tent in plain sight when there were kids that would want to use it? Wow. First of all, your parents want to host the holidays so Emily won't have the tent? So they just want to take her safe space away like that? That's yikes. And no, not the jerk. These people need to teach their kids what boundaries are, and if that's too difficult, make them handle disappointment better. Because let's be honest here, there's going to be a lot of toys they're going to see and want to play with, but they won't be able to because they're not theirs. This is not something for you, OP, to deal with, but the parents of the other kids. It doesn't say in your post how the kids responded to this though. Was it even an issue for them after you explained and set the rules about the tent? Not the jerk. Thank you for being such a caring foster parent and giving Emily a safe space. It's not your fault that your parents and siblings don't understand. It's her space, not anyone else's, and I'm glad you held your ground for her until the end. You don't understand. I travel a lot. Yeah, but that still doesn't make you correct. A crazy lady called me on the phone tonight about her reservation for the next business day, but booked it for the current day. She wanted to check in at 2 a.m. and have it count for the next business day. So she expected to check in at 2 a.m. and stay in the room for over 24 hours and only pay for one night. It wasn't those guests that are confused by hotel time, day rollover, etc. Either she full-on expected me to break the rules for her, she had a reservation for the current day that she made through Central. A little after 12 a.m. she calls. Crazy lady. I need to check in early at 2 a.m. Me. I'm sorry? I need to check in early at 2 a.m. and check out the next day. My spidey senses are on high alert from her tone alone. I've dealt with a lot of people like this before. Me. I understand. Our check-in time is at 3 p.m. the day of the reservation. If you require an early check-in, I can certainly do that after I close out the day around 3 a.m. No. I need to check in at 2 a.m. for the next day, not tonight. Me. Okay. Our check-in time is 3 p.m. after 3 a.m. I can check you in for the next business day with an early check-in fee in addition to the regular room rate for the night. Awkward pause. I travel a lot and that has never been an issue. Me, thinking to myself, yeah right, liar. As posted on our website, our check-in time is 3 p.m. If you require an earlier check-in, I can provide that with an early check-in fee in addition to the regular rate for the day. People like this can sniff blood a mile away and want you to get flustered so that they can use that against you. There's no way I'm checking her in at 2 a.m. for the next day because that's impossible. And even if it weren't, I wouldn't do that without an early check-in fee. I don't doubt she travels a lot and probably twisted some poor night audit's arm somewhere and got what she wanted. But I won't and can't grant her request. Crazy lady. Another long pause. I've stayed at your brand a lot and they always have helped me out. So you're telling me you can't? Or don't know how? Me. Our check-in time is 3 p.m. You said that already. I need to check in at 2 a.m. for tomorrow. Okay, I can do this too, ma'am. You booked a room for tonight. I can check you in at 2 a.m. However, you will have to check out at 11 a.m. And if you want to extend your stay for an additional night, 
We can certainly process that for you here at the hotel before 11 a.m. And of course, you are always welcome to dial our central reservations and they will gladly accommodate you as well. She hung up on me and a few minutes later, a booking agent from Central called me for clarification and I told him what I told her. They put me on pause several times as they relayed what I said earlier to her again. She was lying to them, claiming that someone she spoke to earlier at our front desk told her that she could check in early and avoid an early check-in fee. She then demanded my name, apparently, and I refused to give it to her because of her misrepresentation of our interaction. I then told them she can contact my management personally, but her demands are something I simply cannot provide. She insisted on getting my name and I was done. I told them I won't give that info and I've already explained to her several times our policy about early check-ins and if she doesn't cancel her reservation before I run audit, I will charge her as a no-show. She never showed up and didn't cancel a reservation, so I charged her. I'm off today, so I left a bunch of notes in case crazy shows up. Am I the jerk for refusing to take care of my grandkids on a trip my son paid for me? I have one son, 30 male, and two grandkids who are four and five. I take care of them two to three times a week for three to four hours a day. I don't mind taking care of them, but it is exhausting. At the beginning of November, my son invited me to go with him, his wife, kids, and in-laws to travel from the 15th to the 22nd of December. I asked how much this trip was, and it wasn't cheap, so I said I didn't want it because it wasn't something I wanted to spend on at the moment. He offered to pay as a gift, and I decided to accept on the condition that I would not babysit my grandkids at any time, and this would be my vacation. He agreed. In a few spaced conversations, I asked why they didn't leave the kids with my ex-husband during this period, as it is a very romantic city. They said they wanted a family trip. By the way, my ex-husband loves his grandkids, and they spent almost three weeks at his house once. He didn't go on the trip for other reasons. On the trip, I wasn't very proactive in taking care of my grandkids. Honestly, apart from a few well-spaced moments, my son, his wife, their in-laws took care of the kids. I obviously spent time with them. This trip, we basically spent the morning and afternoon together. At night, we were free to do whatever we wanted. I took the opportunity to visit some restaurants and hopping alone. My son and his wife took turns with his in-laws at night with my grandkids because most places weren't family friendly. The sixth day, I decided to stay at the hotel, drink some wine and read a book. My son found out I was staying at the hotel and asked if I could look after them. I declined, saying I had other plans in my room. He started to complain that everyone was helping and taking turns except me, who didn't help with the whole trip he paid for. This really ticked him off. I reminded him that it was his choice to bring two kids to a completely non-family friendly city and that I said before even accepting his gift that I would not take care of the kids because I just want to relax. We ended up arguing and he said, among other things, that I could be a little more grateful for his gift and make this concession for three hours for them and the in-laws to have a free night, but that I'm deciding to be a jerk. I stuck to it and in doubt he would respect this, I ducked into the pool area the whole night. He tried to show up in my room with the kids and just drop them off. Things have been tense ever since, as he said I was a jerk the whole trip. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Imagine holding a trip over your mother's head, your main caregiver. The audacity. Not the jerk. You explain your boundaries before accepting the all paid for vacation. You set the expectation, he shouldn't have assumed you would change. I'm going to go with not the jerk. You provide a free service for your son regularly by helping out with the grandkids. He agreed this would be your vacation and they chose to bring their kids when clearly the city is not a family-friendly city. He violated your previous agreement and you held your boundary. Am I the jerk for taking a nepotism baby joke too personally? At our family New Year's Eve get-together, the topic of nepotism came up. I'm assuming it's something on the top of some people's minds because of the magazines recently. I, 27 male, had seen some buzz about it online, but I can't say I had given it much thought myself. The number of celebrities I care about is a small one, and there's a good chance I don't know anything about their family tree. Because of lack of interest, I didn't participate in the initial conversation. The topic was brought up by my brother-in-law's wife, and I listened for a while before turning to a conversation with my husband. After a few minutes, my brother-in-law's wife said something along the lines of, I want to know OP's thoughts on this since he's a nepotism baby. It was said somewhat jokingly, 
but I was still confused, so I asked her to explain. She said that since I worked for my dad and was basically handed a job when I graduated college, that I was technically a nepotism baby. I replied saying it was a little ridiculous to group me in with actors and models making millions on their parents' name when my husband and I were just regular people working to support ourselves and each other. She said it was beyond just regular people working to support themselves when I made this much in a year. I thought the whole thing was wildly inappropriate to be discussing in front of all these people and I told her so. She said it was just a joke and I was overreacting. The atmosphere was obviously a little tense following that and she all but forced my brother-in-law out the door before the night was even over. There were mixed feelings after she left of people saying I took the joke too personally and people saying she went too far. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. She was out of line. However, she was correct. Your situation is definitely nepotism. It doesn't just apply to celebrities. While she was a jerk for bringing it up and pushing the conversation when it clearly made OP uncomfortable, it genuinely baffles me how OP justifies and excuses the nepotism in his own situation. He doesn't make millions, so therefore being handed his job by his father isn't nepotism? What? Everyone sucks here. Agreed. I've seen a lot of nepotism babies not understand or feel that they're included in this conversation. Anytime your family or family's relations help you get a job, it's nepotism. Money doesn't matter. Everyone sucks here. Your brother-in-law's wife made a tasteless comment and she made herself the jerk by pushing the conversation even more when you were against the comment and took offense to it. The conversation became very inappropriate once you showed how uncomfortable you were. On the other hand, you're failing to see that you are a nepotism baby. Your family started a business and you got to experience an easier time getting your first job out of college because of it. It's very possible that you did a lot of hard work to get yourself that job and it's also possible that someone else just as qualified for the same job got passed over just because your family owns the company. You did nothing wrong by taking the job and your family have not done anything wrong by giving you the job. But you should recognize that you were lucky to receive a privilege in life that most people don't get to have. Edit. I understand that people may not like the term, and yes, the term itself is usually used in a negative way. I believe that OP is in the wrong by not seeing how much nepotism does apply to them. They seem to generally think nepotism happens with the rich and famous only. I want to make OP aware that the small business and hardworking people can fall into nepotism as well. Your dad gave you a well-paying job. You're a nepotism baby with no sense of humor. You're the jerk for pretending that's not the case. Info. Why are nepotism babies so in denial of their privilege? Not the jerk. You Reddit loons never cease to amaze me. Someone can't work in the family business without you accusing their family of nepotism? Let me explain this for you unstable, unsuccessful leeches on society. Nepotism is an unfair advantage given to a relative. If you hire your son because he's the most qualified applicant and you trust him, that's not nepotism, that's called common sense. You guys love handouts from the government and you feel entitled to them. Yet, when someone hires a relative, you all flip out and claim nepotism. This is why none of you will ever have successful businesses of your own. You lack common sense and you're always looking for a way to be the victim and for the world to be unfair against you. If someone has a great job working for their family's company, you as a decent person should just be happy for them, not jealous that they have a steady income while you live off Doritos and Mountain Dew. My heart goes out to the kids reading all this insanity and thinking that this is how pathetic most people are these days. Reddit is not an example of how stupid people are in the real world. I've met countless people over the years, and none of them were as pathetic as the people on this site. Edit. Since so many of you are jealous losers and claiming that I'm a nepotism baby myself, no, I'm a day trader that shorts failing companies to help them go under. I also buy medical debt and collect on it, which I've been doing for the past 12 years. My biggest problem in my life right now is deciding where to park my 3 million cash this year. Victims never win, so stop acting like one. Am I the jerk for refusing to take in a foster child? My husband, 44 male, and I, 43 female, have two kids. Both left for college and one is in law school now, so we are empty nesters. I love it. I get to go wherever, whenever. Right now I'm skiing a lot and we take lots of vacations. I'm planning on retiring in a few years. We invested smartly and now our home is paid off and my kids are getting a full ride in school. We can retire without too much worry 
although we will still work until the economy is better and our bodies allow us to. Problem is, my husband is now bored and wants to foster a child. I'm absolutely against the idea. My cousin did foster a kid for three years. She's infertile and decided she wanted to foster as a way to have a kid in her life. But that kid was a complete nightmare and almost made her and her husband divorce over it because it caused so many issues. I know not all foster kids are like that, but my cousin is far more compassionate, she's a nurse, than me, and she was crying to me and my sister about it every day, and I don't want to do it. It's hard to tell what a kid has gone through, and it's usually nothing good if they need to be fostered. I don't have the energy to deal with it anymore. I raised my son and daughter, and unless they need me, I'm going to finish my last years at work and then retire and enjoy my quiet years. My husband constantly badgers me to reconsider, and I told him I'm not going to. He argues it will be like having a kid again, and I told him I don't want that. I told him to find a volunteer position at a school or go down to the children's wing of the hospital. He's a doctor, if he wants to spend time with kids. He also works outside the home while I have a hybrid job, three days in the office, two days at home, so I feel like any foster kid will just become my responsibility. But he's constantly complaining that I'm not being compassionate and we could change a kid's life for the better. But I know it will probably change my life for the worse. Still, am I the jerk for refusing to sign up to be a foster? Not the jerk. Also, was your husband a fun dad who basically got to be the cool guy while you did all the work actually raising the kids? Because children are work, and only a dad who only ever babysat could act like having the responsibility to care for a kid again after 20 years later would be no big deal and a fun adventure. OP. Yup, hit the nail right on the head. Not the jerk. Both parents need to be 110% on board for bringing a foster into your home. Otherwise, you're just one in a long line of foster home stories this kid will have. As someone who was in foster home and then adopted, not the jerk. Fostering a kid isn't just because you're bored. It's a lot of emotional labor, and foster kids are more hyper-aware than most when they aren't wanted. It wouldn't help them, and you would probably resent being pressured into doing it when you already stated you don't want to. Not the jerk. Hope this feedback helps. Support our channel by joining as a member today, and we'll give you a shout-out in our next video. Or come watch this video next. You won't believe what Karen does in that one.